The Collective Whisper Podcast with Simon King. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Collective Whisper podcast. I am your host, Simon Kay, and we're glad you could join us. Today, we have an exciting guest, Mary Allo, all the way from Los Angeles in America. But before we talk to Mary, let's just remind you guys, please follow the show, subscribe, tell your friends, come on board. Lots of great guests for you to hear. So let's move on. Mary Allo is an American film and television producer focusing on faith-based action and drama. She is the owner of Allo Entertainment, based in Beverly Hills, California, which has produced movies including Bruised with Halle Berry, Marlowe with Liam Neeson, Battle in Seattle, When a Man Falls in the Forest, While She Was Out, Gnome, Tortured, and The Princess and the Marine. Allo was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the youngest of three girls. She moved to Los Angeles to attend the University of Southern California, where she participated with other students on a music magazine titled Rock, distributed in 35 countries. Her interest in journalism led her to work as an entertainment reporter for US Weekly and Entertainment Weekly Radio. Allo moved to New York and transitioned to producing talk shows such as CBS's Geraldo. She went on to produce reality TV shows and specials such as The Susan Powder Show, Caught in the Act, and Case Closed. Allo's first executive producer credit was for the Columbia TriStar television movie The Princess and the Marine. She followed with producing feature-length films When a Man Falls in the Forest. Mary Allo participates in charities that support children, women, and animals. She's an active supporting member of the Pasadena Humane Society and Pitbull Rescue. Welcome to the show, Mary. Hello, Mary Allo. Welcome to the show. Great to have you here. It's been a long time coming. We've been wanting to talk and do this for a while, so I appreciate your patience on my busy schedule. And I know you've got one, too. And you're, hey, I'm part Irish, and I know you're from Galway, and I'm actually doing a movie in Ireland right now, uh, hopefully to get out there soon with Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Good and Sony, and uh, I've got a great movie coming out that we shot part of it in Ireland and with the uh, incredible Irish actor Liam Neeson coming out wow. February 8th, 2000 screens in America. That's brilliant. And you know, right now, obviously, with the Oscar nominations, the Irish are in the news a lot with so many Oscar nominations. So. It's a really strong time for Irish actors and the Irish acting scene. A hundred percent. Well, Ireland, and it is an incredible place to shoot, and they are smart. They have maximized their tax incentives to wonderful, wonderful grants and incentives for filmmakers like myself, producers, writers, to be able to work there. I'm doing another movie as well this year with Benedict Cumberbatch producing as well, and I'm producing, and he's starring with himself and. Laura Dern and Noah Jew from Quiet Place 1 and 2. And we're shooting that in Cologne, Germany. And they also have incredible soft loans and Maximize and doing another movie with two giant stars. I can't announce it. We're going to announce it in okay. Berlin. I'm doing one of my own movies that I've co-written. We've got three of, the, three of those going this year. And that's a big new step for our company. I own it and I co-wrote it. We're shooting in Budapest in March. So I'm really... Uh, Getting to be overseas quite a bit and enjoying that experience as well. And that's the beauty of filmmaking. It can take you to so many places and meet incredible people as well and hopefully put out an interesting message through our medium. Yes. And the great thing, I suppose, being in your the seat you're in, you know, in production, you get to meet such amazing actors. You get to travel to amazing places and you get to work with some amazing scripts and, and directors and everything, which is a great thing, no? We do. I'm very picky. i blessed to have honed the relationships with the major agencies of CAA and UTA and WME and also other co-financiers and their friends and also stars and their co production companies. Stars have gotten smart. Most of them have their own production companies now. So they're looking to get movies financed and co-produced and uh, foreign sales companies, management firms. So I'm getting an influx of incredible projects that I wear two hats. Well, three now. Either I'm the lead producer. I'm doing a movie with Netflix, big budget, big star. And definitely I am excited about that this year. We haven't announced it. We'll announce soon. Very exciting project. And and I'm also a lead producer on my own movie called Bird's Eye with Maria Bakalava and other stars. That starts 
pre-production of March in Budapest and other movies, but I'm also an executive producer. So to define the two, where I really bring in the financing of the picture. On the Anthony Hopkins movie that we're shooting in Ireland right now with Sony, I brought in some of the financing. I have a roster of 11 investors that are incredible human beings, first and foremost. They're all very unique as well. Wonderful men and women. I'm proud to say I've got, gosh, I think five of them are women. And they're all very high net worth. We're really in the movie business, but keep investing with me. You know, we've done anywhere from two to seven pictures with all of them. They keep going because we're getting their money back. We're getting their investment, their premium and a profit and bringing great pictures to them. It's important. Yes. And, you know, that's a great thing. And I like the way that you do it, you know, where you sometimes get this 100 percent financing and you work with the right people. And I suppose for you, it you know, it is a challenge to go out and meet these people. But once you meet the right people and you have the right people on board, it's probably much easier to make those movies then, no? Well, it is. I remember it was Sharon Stone, who I'm close with, and we've traveled and done a few movies. She said it was sort of like riding a bicycle, right? Uphill, uphill, uphill. And then there's a point where you kind of like are at a level where you've learned so much and you've earned the trust and you've done well enough where you're now at that point where you don't have to keep going uphill that you kind of have a, I don't want to say it's smooth riding because making movies is never easy. It's You have to be passionate about it. It's so yeah. many moving parts as the producer. And now as a co-writer with my partner, Tim Hayes, where we've got some really great movies coming out. I mean, I should say coming up that we're making. It's our first year with that. And the agencies have gotten behind us with the scripts. So I'm very excited. But yeah, right. it does. Get, I don't know if it says it gets easier. It does get, first of all, you learn a lot, right? I'm self-taught. Uh, I learned through 22 years. And I've done about, I don't know, 41 movies, 42 in the, number of series as well, but I'll always be learning. I yeah. don't really get along with people that tell me they know it all and they're not going to, they don't need to learn anything else. I also don't get along with people that tell me they're backer or they know of an investor and they have so much money, they don't care if they get their money back. That's a big non-starter with me. I have a billionaires, a billionaire, somebody worth a half a bill, multimillionaires, but you have to treat their money as your own. It doesn't matter how much they have. I mean, they're looking at you to hopefully say, yeah, we're not only making a great quality film, but you're going to get your investment back. Plus, generally, if it's equity, 20% premium, you know, on that money over a course of about 18 months and a profit on it, you know, and working also with the streamers has been really joyous and wonderful. It's a faster process when we sell a movie to the streamers and it's done really well because you get so many eyeballs on it, like yeah. Bruce with Halle Berry. One of yes, the movies. Great, great movie. Yeah, we were number one in 21 countries. We had about 100 million eyeballs on it. Wow. So, you know, I don't think we would have gotten it in the theaters. So yeah. I'm a I'm big, you know, proponent of streamers. And even the ones that I've got these AAA list stars on, it's like, let's go. The Marlowe movie with Liam Neeson, more I came in as the fi- one of the fi- one of the many financiers. So I didn't really have to say in it. And we have a nice big U.S. release. But would I have been happy if we had a streamer on it? Sure. I mean, I would have been just as happy. There are some people that just want a theatrical. And there are some people that, you know, James Cameron doesn't seem to make a mistake. He keeps hitting it out of the ballpark. So I get it. And Steven Spielberg and all that. But for me, I love the streamer situation. But if we have a great theatrical, that's wonderful, too. You can't replace going to a theater, getting some good popcorn, mixing in a little bit of candy, and enjoying the experience on the big screen. That is still exciting. Of course. and. You know, for you, when you going back a little, because you obviously worked on TV as well, and you worked on Geraldo and some other shows, was that a big difference moving from TV to film? Well, it's interesting you said that. So I moved to New York when I was younger and then ended up moving back and worked for news magazine shows at Paramount. I was actually a head of publicity for a publishing firm for self-help books. I had books like Drawing from the Right Side of the Brain, Love is a Drug, 40 something, you know, the art of, you know, all these different things. But to get my clients at the time, the writers on these shows, I was packaging all these talk shows and I didn't really know that that's what we're producing. So within a year, I had three offers for talk shows. So at the time, I did take Geraldo, and uh, it was a fun experience. I lived in New York during that time. What it taught me was finding the real-life story. Every morning, 
we had to look through newspapers and comb everything we could to really find the most incredible stories. What happened out of that was the princess and the marine about a marine that smuggled a Iranian princess mm. to America. They fell in love and that became one of the top five bidding wars for TV movies. Well, it was. It may not be now, but it was one of the top bidding wars. So it was like a half a million. I'm like, oh, this is easy. <laughs> well, it wasn't. <laughs> that was my first time out. It was when lightning strikes. I love the true life story. I still do a lot of those. They're the most meaningful to me or things that are based on true events. The movie I'm doing that I own and I co-wrote called Bird's Eye is based on sex espionage, the art okay. of sex and gaining, se you know, government secrets through that exploitation and assassination. Government secrets through seduction and this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah, so that's our wow. movie and out of London years ago and said, I want to make this one day. So we're making it. It's my first movie that I co-wrote. We have a few going this year and it, it is the girls are called swallows and the boys are called ravens. Thus, it's called bird's eye. Oh, okay, yes. Um, and so it's a very exciting action thriller, but it's based on a program that Putin had, you know, really heightened and during the KGB time and, and, you know, what, you know, infiltrating in America, UK. So we're not anti-Russian in any way or anti-American. No. But certainly we're showing the exploitation of what these beautiful young boys, girls out of high school, out of college, for their athletic prowess, their looks, their intelligence, serving Mother Russia. They had no idea that once they got in, they couldn't get out, at least. Yeah, it sounds a really interesting movie. And, you know, obviously with the Cold War and through history, lots of that has been touched on. But your story sounds like it's going to go deeper and it's going to go sh show hidden things that we've never heard about. Based on true events. And, you know, it was really interesting. I had written it started in 2016, but, um, you know, was on everybody's tip of their time was Trump and COVID and all this over the last few years. And suddenly, unfortunately, then it became Putin. But that also gave way for us to be able to get this movie done and out. We think it's an important film to show. Very good. So let's talk a little about, you know, how you actually kind of wanted to become a producer and how you wanted to work in journalism and so on. So when you were younger, you know, what were your aspirations? What did you want to be when you were a teenager? Well, we just lost her. Barbara Walters was one of mine. I always looked up mm. to her when I was young and all the way through life. You know, I also um, took a, we called it the senior project where I worked at the NBC local newsroom then and putting stories. So I think it was always inside of me finding something deeper. What's really going on? You know, I'm thinking back to my my high school papers about cloning, different things that sort of weren't always the normal things to write about. Uh, so I always wanted to kind of go deeper. I was the kid that always raised my hand and asked why. So uh, I still ask that, right? So <laughs> that leads me to making movies to either exploit important issues like the Battle of Seattle or uh, with I did with Charlize Theron and Channing Tatum, Woody Harrelson, Michelle Rodriguez about the World Trade Organization, or Worth, the Ken Feinberg story. He was brought in, attorney, to, you know, really, on behalf of the insurance, with a mathematical equation to give all the people, families of people that died in 9-11, very little money as much as possible, but he had an arc and a change, and he became the proponent for the families called Worth with Stanley Tucci and Michael Keaton. It's on Netflix. Yes. Or 50 Steps. I'm looking around at some of the, the posters. Yeah, some here. great posters there of some of the movies you've yeah. done. When you approach a movie, for example, or you have an idea for a script or you meet somebody who has an idea. Do all of these things have to come together to kind of have the perfect storm? So you have to have the financiers, you have to have a good script, you have to have the need, the want to do that particular movie as well, I imagine. Well, I'd say the want and the desire and passion yeah. to be writing. I mean, at least for me, I'm writing on the weekends and at nights with my co-writing partner, Tim Hayes. And it's like, it's a lot yeah. of work. For example, we've done 60 drafts on Bird's Eye. 60 okay. that's going this year. I can't talk about it at the moment, but that's 50 drafts, 57 drafts. So the amount of work that goes in it. So it's all passion, first of all. Right. Second of all, well, how do you take it from the idea or the book or this, you know, to the screen? 
well, I'm not a right brainer only, I'm a left brain. So I do left and right. So I'm a film finance expert. So then I start putting things all together. It's a lot of work. The equity, the senior lending gap, the, the gap of it, the mezzanine position, you know, the distribution and also the packaging, I'm a packaging producer, right? I'm the girl that if it does win an Oscar, you know, and I put it all together, you know, I get to go up on stage, you know, putting the stars in, the director, all that. It's so many moving pieces. A lot of people probably call themselves a producer EP, but, you know, I'm not sure everybody does everything that yeah, myself and I, there are many other people that I respect do. Sometimes I look at producers, you see their names and credits and everything and TV shows and movies and everything. And, you know, it's kind of a bit like music nowadays where you have so many songwriters involved in one song. Yeah. Sometimes there's numerous. So I can imagine a lot of stars just for even equity want to have production credits, don't they? Bringing in equity is important. That's the yeah. hardest part. You know, the senior lending against collateralized loan and sales is a little bit easier. The tax credits, many, many are incentives. There's a line of people that will finance those against those. But it's a lot of work. But, you know, there are some people that will push an email or a button or. And when you're a producer that works really hard, it's hard to see that. But, you know, God bless them. I think what happens is, you know, everybody wants their piece of the pie. And the problem is that. People kind of say, well, yeah, I can be involved in that or I want a part of it. And then, you know, as you said, you're doing all the hard work and you can both have the same titles or whatever. But sometimes, you know, who's doing the work, don't you? Well, I do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> uh, I was at Simon, if you're sitting watching Netflix or Amazon or Hulu or HBO or you're sitting in the theater, I'm not sure you would necessarily or the audience would. You know, but I can tell you that making them, I do for sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I understand. I And, and uh, I think it's a hidden art because I know myself, even when I got into podcasting and you have to, you know, research the guests, you have to find the guests, you have to book, you have to do all these things. And then you kind of realize then the value of producer on movies. There's so many things they must have to do and many balls in the air, don't you? Tell my co-writing partner, because he's purely a writer mm. and he's a great one and i'm so grateful we've been working together and we're starting our next script uh we've got another movie armatist this year that should be going this year we just got a great director on board about eisenhower we're doing it with eisenhower's oh, great grand laura magdalene eisenhower it's when he met with the aliens the grays oh yeah uh, three times and also the majestic 12 and the whole government cover-up and it's, it's uh, between 1953 and 1961 it's fabulous i honestly know it's a great script we're getting great reviews on it and so, but I tell them, I said, listen, you know, I need to now do the other hundred things. That's only the initial part, the, the first link in the chain. You have to add all the other links to make it actually work, don't you? I do. But, you know, it's what I do. And yes. uh, I've chosen, chosen me, I guess. And so, you know, to answer that very long question, getting real life stories, Going from publicity to talk shows, news magazines, getting those stories has translated and then getting into features into movie making for yeah, the last, yeah. yeah. I noticed there as well, you, when you were, you know, in University of Southern California, you worked on a music magazine, Rock. It was distributed in a lot of 35 countries and so on. So what was your relationship with music like at that time? Did you want to be a musician? Uh, were you ever a singer or anything? You know... First of all, I dropped out of college. I want to inspire people two ways here. A, finish college if you can. Yeah. You're lucky to. I certainly hurt, you know, it didn't help with my mom. And God bless her. She was my soulmate and everything and inspiration. And she passed a few years ago. But, you know, she's like, what? How could you? But I went to work. And, you know, some of the most successful people are dropouts. I always want to encourage people that either don't have the financing or don't have the opportunity to get, just get to work. If you yeah. do have the opportunity to go to college, go, you know, but this business, unless you want to be an agent, then you go to Harvard or you go to the Ivy Leagues or whatever, but you're going to still start in the mailroom. Um, yes. But if, as far as myself goes, yes, I went and I was there. And out of that, we started Rock Magazine. It was great. And I was sitting with some of the biggest rock stars. I would go to their home, interview them. And it was, it was a lot of fun and wild time. I wouldn't trade it for anything, but that was really the start of journalism and interviewing. But I had great photo shoots at their homes. 
great interviews and, you know, everybody from Bob Dylan to, I mean, lots of people. I imagine even having that experience of interviewing those people and then, you know, in later years going into production and working with lots of stars, you know, you're not going to be starstruck or awestruck because you, you've you worked with those kind of people before. I am so not starstruck. I think that somebody maybe politically, look, I did a movie where Obama and Michelle and, and President Obama were executive producers. That's worth on mm. Netflix. Um, that's probably where I would get a little more starstruck on the actors. I can't think of one. I mean, I have favorite actors like Viola Davis and, and Meryl Streep and, you know, many more. But I just, uh, no, not starstruck. And yeah. I, I feel like they're a peer and, and, you know, we just treat each other with respect and value each other's participation in the production. And, you know, you originally, as far as I know, you're from Philadelphia. So when you moved from Philadelphia to Los Angeles, is that something that was a big change in your life? Because obviously the East Coast and West Coast are very different. And did you decide Los Angeles is for me? Well, I didn't quite do that. My father passed and moved to St. Louis. I went to a private school and then I went from there to SMU in Dallas. And I thought it was OK, but I knew that I wanted to be in either Los Angeles or New York. So I went to Los Angeles and I loved it. And I've been here ever since, except I did go and live in New York producing talk shows at the CBS building, you know, downstairs was 60 minutes and they have a bagel with Morley Safer. And it was an exciting experience. But I also moved back. I did love living in New York, but I do like living here a lot. It's a nice lifestyle. And if you work hard and have the opportunity, I do like it a lot. Chicago has a great hub now. And Atlanta is really like Hollywood South. So I've done several movies there too. You know, yes. And, you know, I remember talking to you a few weeks ago and tragically you had lost one of your dogs. And I know you're a, a big dog person and you work with a lot of charities and with women and animals and, you know, and children and everything. So is that something that you, you know, find that takes you away from the production side of work that is good for your soul? I'm so glad you asked me about this. Nobody asked me about this. My heart and soul are animals, whether it's dogs, elephants, orangutans, and uh, really fighting for their voiceless souls. Yeah. Yeah. And an activist this morning, I had to wake up to Graham and a dog's being beaten on a balcony. The guy had only not even started beating. He left and then he came back to beat the dog more. So I called the Dallas Police Department this morning. They're not doing anything. Nothing against police officers, it's fine, but this man needs to be arrested for a felony and uh, the dog needs to be extracted. So every moment that I'm not making movies, I shouldn't say every moment, but most of my time, if I'm not traveling, I am helping place dogs, donate, alert, viral, mostly dogs because, you know, I'm, I'm not around, you know, orangutans, but there are travels that I want to do to help certain primates and elephants that are in need. And that is where I end up, you know, the money and the the fame is fleeting. So, you know, when you first start out, it's exciting. It's not as exciting. But I have to say the the reason for what I'm doing is so that I can leave everything to helping these animals. So you hit it. And yes, I was paralyzed in pain, losing my yeah. pup. Um, and I did a lot of healing and crying and healing. I do a lot of prayer. So I'm a faith-based girl. And luckily, I have one other pup that I rescued the same day, both on death row. They didn't know each other in 2011. So she's still with me. So wow. she definitely got me through part of this process of healing. Yeah. But Animals are great in that sense, because the time, you know, when you lose them, and then you come across another animal, a rescue or something. I will always rescue. You know, it's funny. One of my best friends, she's the number one stunt woman in the world. And she used to have a big black wolf. And the wolf would fly first class next to her. A giant black wolf. Her new dog, they were in Bulgaria. They were in Ireland. They were in everywhere. It is a requirement to bring that dog. It's so well done. So I, you know, not now. My, my other dog is elderly too. But I think one day that's going to be a requirement, you know, for emotionally supporting each other. I can't live in a world without pup and without rescue, by the way. I'm very mm. vehement against buying dogs. I have friends that do. I don't hold back my opinion, but, um, you know, rescuing is so important. So you've hit my cause and it's definitely animals. Ever since I've been a little girl, I've been like that. 
Yeah. Like there, when you talk about, you know, the mistreatment of animals, also like you work with, you know, women and children charities. So yeah. do you see a correlation in all of those types of charities with bureaucracy and, you know, the police and trying to file reports about mistreatment and you find that yeah. there's a lot of that. It's very difficult. Look, I have respect for the police. Don't mm. get me wrong. You know, I'm in the Hollywood Hills. Yeah. And, you know, you go down and I am very blessed, a beautiful home. And, you know, I have a nice office, Beverly Hills, all that. But, you know, I'm going to say something that, you know, yeah, from my home, it's peaceful. I look at the Hollywood sign, the, the hills, the city light. And it's, you can hear just the rustle of the wind and then occasionally the coyotes. But you go two miles down and it's it's like a war zone. So, you know, are important. But what does bother me and being on the phone this morning is like, you know, why aren't you arresting this man who's beaten? It's on tape, a felony. And so, yeah, I mean, look, I, with children, um, there is a voicelessness there too that are in need. And with women, you know, I, I hear I'm a role model for many people, but, you know, most importantly, I would other women I've trained many underneath me and they're all wonderful and we're all close and they've gone on to do really well as producers themselves and you know I want their voice to be heard and you know it's a new time I feel like it is things have changed out here and you know there I felt the ceiling not very many times I never never believed that I would have to have a ceiling, even though I know there is. So I didn't experience it as much because I refused to. I, you know, I love working with men too. So I work with more men often, but it's changing. It's yes. really changing here. So it's it's do, it's definitely a lot more equal. Do you feel that, you know, the Hollywood of old was a very male-dominated industry and now that that's changed? Well, I wasn't there. I only mm. know stories, right? Yeah. So I can only gauge by the time that I've been in it. And if I can say in a positive way, because again, I'm not putting down men at all. And I love working. I have so many great guys to work with and investors and just other producers and directors and all sorts of stars. But I have, I can only, I can't speak to the domination there, but I can say that there's a shift for the betterment and equality with women. And that's right. what I can say. There is a, a thing as well that's kind of prevalent in the acting world, which is that it's very difficult for some women when they get towards their 50s to be cast in roles. If they're famous, fair enough. But a lot of yeah. other actresses who are like on the way up or have been working for years, whether it be in theater, TV or film, once yeah. you hit a certain age, there's a lot of ageism for women, isn't there? There is, there is, and you're right. I have many friends that are uh, even big stars, were big stars, or, or and even that. And I think it's changing. I do think it's changing, but it's that slow to change, and it's unfortunate. Yeah. And it may not just be women. Maybe it's also just the ageism. You know, I think sometimes. Period. And. Yeah. It, Typical, you know, and maybe that's just life. That happens in normal jobs too. That's what I'm saying. For the people that are in front of the camera, yeah, it's probably harder because you're looking at everything, yeah. right? Yeah. But look, there's many directors, producers, they work all the way in their 80, you know, like I I don't know if I want to be doing I want to be traveling the world and helping animals and sanctuaries and things at one point. But you know, I, I'm gonna be working in this business, God willing, with good health and you know, doing yeah. well. Yeah, I do see it. And it's sad and it's difficult to see. I think what a lot of people, you know, when you talk about this, it's when you watch certain A-list male actors and they're, yeah. for example, playing somebody who's maybe 50 or 55, but then yes. their wives are always like in their late 20s or early 30s. And yeah. you find, like, of course, you can have that in real life too, you know, with men with younger wives. But I think it happens a lot in Hollywood where the men have a greater chance of that longevity, whereas the women, usually their wives are younger actresses, no? I can't say that. I don't know. I think it depends on the type of movie you watch. And also, another question I have for you about the streaming services. So do you think that changed the whole landscape of movie making and the TV world as well with Netflix and HBO and Hulu and all these? 100%. Look, 
I mean, first of all, the premiums, right, came out with the non-commercials, right? Now commercials are coming on, so you have to pay the extra not to get the commercials. So that was the HBOs and Showtimes and all of those. And then the streamers came out, you know, which are incredible. I mean, you know, you're getting, first of all, you're getting series from all over the world, right? I've watched things that are completely in another language subtitled or because they can give you the voice you can hear it in english you know that we wouldn't have been privileged to and then of course i don't know about you but i don't like watching commercials i'm like stop mm. no, i don't want to see you unless i'm watching the super bowl i don't want a commercial in okay yeah. so you know also you know between the pandemic but a lot of people i may be one of them have been like i don't really want to go out that much right you want to be able to really enjoy your home environment unless you're going to the movies and it's special and it's there on the big screen. You know, the Marvel movies, the the big horror, the DreamWorks animation, those type will always, or the avatars, you know, get into the big screen. But there's something beautiful, especially now we have many of us, not all of us, but many of us have these big flat screen TVs and you know the sound and all that. You know, it wasn't like that years ago. And we get to kind of have all of our own home theaters without being privileged and having an actual home theater. Many people do out here, but you actually just, you know, can watch it on your telly. So I think there is a convenience of it. <clears throat> and as, a, as far as being a filmmaker, as I said, I think it's a real blessing because on, this, on the independent side, we may have gotten swallowed up and not as many people saw it. You know, I've had many premieres at Sundance, at Cannes, at Toronto Film Festival, you know, Berlin, and the, the highest quality movies I've gotten in, the ones that I've produced or executive produced. But that doesn't mean you'll have a lot of people seeing it. If it gets on a streamer, we'll have millions of people potentially seeing it. So I think it's a blessing. It was really great talking to you. And just before I let you go, if you would like to tell us, just remind us again of the latest movies coming out that we can look out for. That would be great. Well, Simon, I want to thank you, by the way. I'm glad we did this. And yes. um, you're a good interviewer. And I'm excited to see this. This is our biggest year. I usually do about four to five movies a year. I'm doing six movies this year. And yes. We can handle it. We can do it. Yeah. Right now, as far as in production, um, we just started on this past Monday with Anthony Hopkins and Matthew Good with Sony called Freud's Last Session. And we get to see the amazing best actor on the planet, Anthony Hopkins, playing Sigmund Freud and Matthew Good playing C.S. Lewis. And it's about the existence of God. So I think it's going to be fabulous. And it'll be out on Sony. We don't have, we're just shooting, you know, we're just in pre production now. Yeah. I roll into Bird's Eye, as I spoke about earlier, that's my own movie in Budapest. I, I roll into Morning with Benedict Cumberbatch, I've been starring and producing in Laura Dern and Noah Jupe, and one other star that I'm not going to say, but huge movie just came out. We're wow. going to announce. I also have a Netflix big film we haven't announced yet with a big star who's got a, a deal with Netflix, big young star, an amazing true story about a young woman that plane got hit by lightning. She spiraled 10,000 feet in her chair, strapped to it, and landed upside down in the treetops of the Amazon and lived for wow. 11 days, 18 years old in 1971. Wow. That yeah. sounds really good. And then we've got coming out this year, Tin Soldier with Robert De Niro and Jamie Foxx and Scott Eastwood, Clint Sun, and Rita Ora, the rock star, uh, pop star. Yeah. It's really about the government and PTSD. So it's a very important topic, but very exciting picture. And also... Marlowe's coming out, as I said, with Liam Neeson and Diane Kruger, Jessica Lange in 2000 screens, February 15th in America. And I know I've got some other movies coming out. I can't think Don't about worry. Right that, that sounds like a lot. Well, listen, Mary, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And I want to commend you on all the great work you've done and, you know, for being a strong, strong woman in Hollywood and showing your worth. Excuse the pun. And um, so we look forward to talking to you in the future. So. Thank you very much, Mary Allo. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mary Allo. It was great talking to you all the way over in Los Angeles. And we're excited about all these new movies coming out. The movie Marlowe sounds really interesting. And of course, we have the wonderful Liam Neeson in this movie. So we're really looking forward to that. Not to mention all your other movies and your own movie, Bird's Eye, which sounds really interesting about sexploitation during the Cold War and between Russia and America. So 
I'm really interested to hear that and just want to say well done in your career so far. We really admire what you've done and you're a great role model for women and men everywhere. So keep up the good work and also keep up the great work with your charities and your humane work and everything. So we commend you on all of that. And to you, the listeners, we appreciate you coming along again for another episode. We promise you great guests and I hope we're delivering and I'm enjoying interviewing these people and I hope you're enjoying listening. My name is Simon K. This is the Collective Whisper podcast. Till next time, look after yourself, your family and the people you love. Take care. Bye bye.